Hey folks, Gavin Roth here with episode 28 of the Roth Revenue Podcast. This is the Influencers of Sponsorship Marketing series, and the focus of this episode is purpose-driven partnerships. 10,000 meals a day, MLSE and Second Harvest team up to feed Toronto. That was the name of an amazing partnership with Purpose, spearheaded by MLSE in April. To get the backstory and deeper context around why it was and is so important, I am joined by Lori Nickel, CEO of Second Harvest, Canada's largest food rescue organization and a global thought leader on food recovery. Mike Samardzik, who is a partner at XMC, one of Canada's leading sponsorship and experiential marketing agencies. And Mike Bartlett, who is Vice President of Community Affairs for Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, owners and operators of my world champion Toronto Raptors. MLSC does so much more for the city than operates sports and entertainment properties. They play a crucial role in times of need. Mike shares how they came up with an idea to convert the floor of Scotiabank Arena into a kitchen that pumps out over 10,000 meals a day for frontline workers and the disadvantaged. Second Harvest is a partner of MLSE and work closely with them to distribute the meals. Lori shares eye-opening details of how big this issue is and how our organization helps those in need. Among other services, XMC advises brands like Sobeys on ways to maximize their sponsorships. We are seeing more brands adopt a purpose-driven mindset. Mike shares details of how Sobeys plays a key role in the food supply chain and how partnerships and sponsorships are a great way to amplify CSR platforms. Our 40-minute chat includes a variety of great insights and even a Raptors parade story. I hope you enjoy. And for more episodes of the Roth Revenue Podcast, follow me on LinkedIn, visit Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or check out RothRevenue.com. All right. So uh, thanks, everybody. I'm going to start with an observation and an admission. Um, you know, through COVID, uh, we've noticed uh, the spotlight placed on some causes, um, obviously, other than the the massive health crisis and the economic crisis that we're facing. Um, two of the causes that st have stood out to me, um, one is mental health and the other one is, is food waste and hunger. And I was saying this to Lori when we had a little pre-chat that uh, mental health is, um, I fully am tuned into that. Uh, we as a family have been touched deeply by mental illness. So I'm very aware of it. Um, and so it didn't surprise me. It's like things that you're aware of, you just tend to notice and, and be more aware of. Um, but the food waste and hunger caught me a little by surprise. Lori, you know, chuckled when I said it and said, yeah, well, come on, Gavin, in a pandemic, uh, food, of course. And But I'm, you know, not as close to it. Fortunately, I haven't been impacted by it. Um, you know, uh, that's why you're only looking at the, the, the top half of, my, of me right now. But um, it's been incredible. I've seen all this outpouring of support for the food, um, you know, the food banks and, and the food related charities. And I think it's amazing. So when I decided to do an episode of my podcast on purpose driven partnerships, it was, it, I was very uh, happy to shine a light on this amazing partnership between MLSC and Second Harvest. And we'll talk about that. So, um, so thanks for uh, taking the time joining me. Uh, we have Lori Nickel, who is CEO of Second Harvest, which is Canada's largest food rescue organization and a global thought leader um, on food recovery. Uh, we've got Mike Samardzik, who is a partner at XMC, which is one of Canada's leading uh, sponsorship and experiential marketing agencies. And Mike Bartlett, uh, who is vice president of community affairs for MLSE, which is who are owners of my world champion Toronto Raptors. So it's uh, it's great to have you all. Thank you so much for taking the time. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Good stuff. All right. So uh, Mike uh, Mike B, <laughs> we, we joked we're going to have to do Mike as Mike B. Mike B, I'm going to start with the obvious. Which bus were you on during the parade? Uh, boy, well, I've got, I've got a backstory there that will take a whole other podcast. I was uh, one of the executive producers of that said parade, uh, so wasn't on a bus, but was certainly uh, living through the stress of a uh, 
of a nine hour day. Um, I kind of joked with some friends that if TSN really, really wants or Sportsnet really wants to jam up uh, some of their broadcast time right now, they could just replay the parade and, and take up a day. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. I mean, it was uh, as a, as a fan watching that and you just knew so many things behind the scenes were not going as, as planned, uh, yeah. but, uh, no, but no playbook for that one, but we no have one playbook. Now. We have one now. Um, so most know MLSC as a sport and entertainment enterprise, but when we spoke, you gave me a, a much broader sense of the role your organization plays as a city builder. Could you elaborate a little bit on that to start? Yeah, we've, we've got five um, guiding principles and strategies for MLSC and city builder is a, is a big one, community builder and city builder. We recognize the role that we play in Toronto, um, in Ontario, and, and certainly looking at the Raptors during the playoff run, the role that we play in Canada. And we've made it a core business of ours to make sure that we're addressing uh, social issues in the city, that we're contributing to uh, mandates uh, that uh, the government is looking to achieve and, and certainly collaborate with public-private partnerships. We've been doing this for a long time. The way that we do it evolves and changes. Uh, date back to like early 2000s, we were uh, helping the city refurbish rinks and courts and, and pitches when there just wasn't enough public funds available to keep kind of sport athletic facilities uh, at, the, at the level that they should be in our city and province. We've evolved that uh, to you know, play a bigger role in hosting marquee events. Like when you think about bringing the NBA All-Star Game or Winter Classic, that's a city building and community building approach as well because it is a factor of sport tourism. It's, you know, it helps uh, economic development, but also creates a rally opportunity for uh, residents and fans. And then all, all the way through to how we're addressing um, you know, the world right now and our role in the pandemic. And uh, we've made it a, a commitment to make sure that we're making the right investments that are needs-based. We do a lot of analysis on what the community needs from us rather than just us showing up in a backyard saying, hey, we've got this for you. And, and you know, the community saying, I don't really need it. Or, it's a, you know, very, it's a good goodwill, but it's not good work. Uh, we're really focused on the good work part. Excellent. Thanks. No, that's uh, really eye opening. And uh, I think hopefully gives the listeners a sense that, as I say, it's more than just putting some teams on the field, on the ice, on the court. Um, Lori, um, you know, I was reading, you became passionate about food systems in a very honest fashion. Maybe start there. Tell us how, how you very, came about it. Very organic way. Mm, very organic. Oh, good word. Good word. Better word. <laughs> Being yeah. very poor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, food security has been an issue for me. I mean, sometimes food security and poverty is, you know, it's not a lifetime. It's There's moments in your life where challenges happen. I moved out when I was 15 and was working. And so, you know, food was an issue, but rent was also an issue. Um, when I was 18, I got married. And when I was 28, I was suddenly single with three kids and a part-time job. And I think that was the, the scariest part for me was, oh my gosh, how do I pay the rent and feed the kids? And uh, fortunately, there was a child nutrition program was starting in my son's school and they asked me to run it. And I went, yes, because it wasn't a paid gig, but because I knew I would get food into my kids. And I'm like, so it's not just about food. It's also about this like mental health thing you're talking about. Just like less stress. Okay. <laughs> food is being, my kids are going to be fine. Um, but that brought me to this space of food security that, I, I mean, I didn't know the word food security. I didn't know <laughs> idea what that meant when I was 28. Uh, but it evolved into like, it's not just about my kids. It's about all kids. It's not just about me. It's about all the moms and dads that are struggling. And how do we ensure that they can access not just food, but healthy food, good food, the perishable food that is always the hardest to get because it is the most expensive. And so how do we make sure that we can get that food to them? And I learned at 28 that, oh my gosh, there's all this extra food and it's going in landfill. So it wasn't until I was at Second Harvest that I really made the connection between the landfill and the environmental imperative of keeping it out of landfill. Well, at the same time, you know, we have an issue with people needing food. Now, I will say this, because I say this all the time. Food in itself does not provide food security. It provides food. It provides hunger relief. Poverty is a whole other issue. And at Second Harvest, that's not what we're working on. We really are working on 
environmental, keep that food out of landfill and make sure it gets to people that need food. Yeah, the, and that environmental connection, again, as I read up and uh, more and more about this, so you realize the scale of it. Um, before we move to to the other mic, um, just maybe uh, uh, some some a little further context on the size of the issue in Canada, the food waste and, and um, you know, the impact on the landfills. I was reading some interesting stats, impact on the environment, I should say. Sure. So Second Harvest did research on this a couple years ago. So there's this great uh, document that everyone should read. It's called The Avoidable Crisis of Food Waste. And we've created a roadmap so people can not only understand that vast amount of it, but also where it's happening across the supply chain. Because we often hear it's at the retail level because that's what we see. But it's really further up the supply chain. And it turns out that 58% of all the food produced for Canadians is lost or wasted. 58%. We make enough food, produce enough food for 52 million Canadians. There's only 37 million of us and one in four are food insecure. So there's a systems, like it's a food systems problem. There's enough food in the world to feed everybody. So we got to fix the system. Amazing context. Thanks. Uh, Mike S., uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, I think maybe it's safe to say folks would have a greater sense of MLSE and and uh, certainly now Second Harvest, if you hadn't heard about it, uh, I've been aware of Second Harvest for, for a couple of years now, but uh, XMC, what XMC does, and you, you're, one of your clients is Sobeys, and maybe just a little bit about the role Sobeys is playing in the community during the COVID crisis. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, starting with our company, we are, you know, founded in 06, um, an independent Toronto-based marketing agency that primarily focuses on three pillars of, of marketing, and that is sponsorship, experiential, and, and analytics. I think over the years, we've been able to pull together a very diverse team as it relates to our skill sets and backgrounds. And as it comes to supporting our clients, you know, we primarily focus on you know, strategy and strategic development. Uh, we look at executions and how we can go to market through experiential marketing, you know, and that translates into how we report and essentially optimization. Um, you know, if you look back, I think it was 2013 and in an effort to complement our experiential business, we opened up our staffing side. So, you know, it's been important in the last couple months as we've been sort of under quarantine in this pandemic to support essential businesses, but we have up to 2,500 part-time employees available nationally who are uh, basically on the ready to support any type of field marketing. So that's a little bit about us and what we've been able to do, um, you know, recently and, and some of the backstory about our company. Um, but I mean, segueing into Sobeys, you know, we've been very fortunate that Sobeys has been a partner of ours for a few years and we've developed a really great partnership with them, but they've been very busy over the last couple of months as it relates to COVID. Um, you know, and I'll give you, I'll give you three examples of what Sobeys has, has been focusing on, but first, I mean, they have an enormous history and legacy providing food access to this country across all of their banners, you know, so there's more than just Sobeys, there's Safeway and IGA and Foodland and Farm Boy, you know, and when COVID began taking shape, you know, they really took a step back and focused on their expertise, which is supply chain. And that is really getting those in need what they want. I think, you know, we all saw things flying off the shelf in the first couple of weeks. So they really had to focus on making sure that the shelves were stopped. Two, um, you know, Sobeys has always been an early adopter to improving store practices through thought led insight transformations. And I know, you know, Gavin, you and I have spoken about Sobe sensory shopping hour, which is something that I think, you know, you, you appreciated. And, you know, and I think back uh, maybe a year ago when it started taking shape, but, you know, it was around creating that time in store where sound, light and, and store traffic were diminished for those that were sensitive to them, you know, and, and that same insight led transformations were taken as it was relating to COVID. Um, you know, the first thing they wanted to do was protect their staff. So you saw plexi barriers installed. You saw additional sanitization procedures. You know, next step was making sure the consumer felt safe. So there was uh, managing store traffic and throughput. There was directional arrows that were installed to make sure that, again, you felt safe during your shopping experience in these banners. Um, 
And then three, there was, you know, they provided early access to those more susceptible. So, you know, you're seeing that 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Is, is sort of the elderly hour where we are recommended to stay away. And those, again, more susceptible to COVID have access to the store, um, you know, on, on their own. Um, third thing I wanted to, to speak about, and if you haven't heard of it, um, I suggest you read up on it, but the Sobeys Community Action Fund. I mean, this this took shape early in, in sort of this pandemic. and it really brings the core DNA of, of Sobeys, which is families nurturing families to life. And, you know, a little bit about this. So in, in 1,500 communities across the country, Sobeys is bringing custom acts of support to life, which is guided by the retailers in an effort to address the emergency of COVID. So instead of taking a blanketed approach to this country on how Sobeys can service communities, they're relying on their independent retailers and managers to assess their local community specifically. And they are funded by Sobeys head office to say, here's how we're going to support our community and our local, um, you know, friends and family. So it's, uh, it's been something that's been great to watch come to life. And uh, we're proud to be a partner with them as they continue to manage that fund. Terrific. Um, so let's shift to the initiative. Um, it's called uh, 10,000 Meals a Day. MLSC and Second Harvest team up to feed Toronto. And I know Sobe certainly was uh, at a presence uh, to a degree as well, but certainly the, the core of it with, with MLSC and Second Harvest. So for Mike B, um, you know, tell us, tell us how it came about. Uh, well, you know, it's one of those, it's, it's tough to pinpoint the exact moment, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll relay a few I thought stories. you said it was, I thought you said it was your idea. Absolutely uh, not. I never okay, said all right. that. Okay, I never said it. that. Erase um, and edit that. Okay. You know, I, I yeah, certainly pleasure to, to be a part of, of the evolve, evolution of the idea, but you know, there's a few moments in time that, that led to this. One, um, our company speaks regularly with the city and the province. Um, our president and CEO speaking a lot with the premier and the mayor, understanding you know what the ripple effects of this pandemic might look like, um, and food security became something that was very quickly um, you know positioning itself as a ripple effect issue. Uh, we already had, and actually shortly after the closing of our operations, our sport team operations, uh, we made a donation of raw goods from our uh, foods, our own food supply. Uh, to Second Harvest, and I think it was, I forget how many thousands of pounds of, of food it was that we dropped off to Lori and her team uh, shortly after our seasons were uh, paused. Um, so there's already an authentic relationship between us and Second Harvest and us and and food insecurity. We, we do have a, a nightly drop-off program. So there was something that we already, already knew that, that there was a relationship there. So as we were hearing that food insecurity was going to become a growing issue through the pandemic, uh, some light bulbs went off. And then parallel to that, we actually, you talk about you know, the impact of sponsorship. We were having a, in partnerships, we were having a conversation, a few of us, Chef Z, uh, who deserves a heck of a lot of credit for, for this initiative and, and uh, you know, mobilizing his team to be a part of it. Um, Chef Z and some people from our partnership team and content team and, and myself included, were having a conversation around content. You know, we all of a sudden couldn't be a content business in terms of games played. We had to be a content business in terms of fan experience. And wouldn't it be cool if, you know, five o'clock every day we streamed from the team sites, a different team chef prepping a team meal and people can follow along at home and make their dinner for the next week or two, you know, we're thinking. Um, well, you know, chef says, well, we could probably do that easier in our arena kitchens because We've got all this space and it's not being used. And quite frankly, we've got a bunch of food that isn't going to be used. And what if at the end of it, we package up those meals and give it to Second Harvest, you know, at the end of a, of a day of filming, because I hear that they need packaged meals. You combine that resourcing capacity with the understanding of a growing issue. And then as we got on the phone with Lori and her team, understand more about the issue. And then we get a call from the province saying, like, if you could do anything to boost the morale of frontline workers, we'd be appreciative for you to consider that. So we had a conversation, like, how many meals a day do you think we could do with the food supply that we currently have? And the number was X. And then, well, what if we asked a few partners to come on board? And the number was Y. And then X plus Y plus Z plus whatever. Um, next thing you know, Scotia, Tangerine, BMO, uh, Bell, Rogers are all in as founding partners. We've got upwards of 20 supply chain 
uh, food partners that are friends of our company, either as partners or just friends of our F&B industry as a supplier that are now producing food or uh, driving food towards this initiative. And now our number is 10,000. In fact, it could even reach as many as 13,000 meals a day. And that turns us somehow into like Toronto, Ontario, Canada's largest kitchen overnight. But the importance, and I go back to my first comment, the important part of it, it is driven entirely on our response to a need. It is not a goodwill effort of just, hey, we can do this because it we have the resources. It doesn't matter if we have the resources, if it doesn't match up with serving a need. So we've done a lot of work with Lori's team, a lot of work with the hospital sector to determine like 13,000, we're not hitting that number just because we can. We're hitting that number because we have to. We're hitting that number because the demand is there and and the need is there. And, you know, having that conversation with each and every partner about this, you know, marketing impressions aside and, and all of that kind of, at the end of the day, we're going to judge the success on this on whether we help address the need. Oh, and by the way, it's going to be an amazing story and it's going to be an amazing collaboration and it's going to show leadership on an issue that requires leadership. Uh, that almost becomes the secondary goal. And I, I live in this magic world between corporate and, and community, commercial and community objectives. And I actually think, you know, me and my team have the best job in the company because we kind of yeah. get to wear both hats that way. Um, and everything we do can be needs and outcome based, but everything we do can be with a partner to achieve their mutual objectives sure. as well. So this is a, a, an amazing collaboration. Uh, we talked about it for what seemed like weeks, but was only days. And then next thing you know, we were producing food. And uh, it's unfortunately we are prepared to do this for as long as we need to do this. Oh, um, good, and good, taste, good taste. And, yeah. and unfortunately, we think it's going to be a considerable sure. amount of time. And, and, and before I turn to Lori for Second Harvest perspective on this initiative and the role you're playing and you know where the food ended up, um, you know, something I'll take a, a very a, a slightly scenic route to a point here, which is years ago, I had the pleasure of working uh, for the 2010 Olympic Consortium. And it was a partnership between Bell and Rogers, right? Two companies that do battle, right? They obviously are co-owners of MLSE. Um, but anytime you see entities that, that are rivals coming together, it catches the eye. My daughter the other day, one of my daughters sends me a, an Instagram post of one of the meals arriving and Lori will expand on this where where with one of those who who the frontline workers and and the 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 packaging had the brands who are supporting this initiative and I just as a as a sponsorship partnership executive I love seeing Scotiabank and BMO on the same packaging right I mean two companies that really we all know are 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 rivals um, competitors but for the greater good said, hey, we're all in, right? And and how can we help? So I love that. Uh, Lori, um, maybe tell us a little bit more about the role Second Harvest played and you know where the food ultimately got to. Well, first I'd like to say we love MLSE. I mean, we love everybody, <laughs> but they really did fill a huge void. COVID hitting this country and this city hit it with a bang and everybody had to pivot and shift, including the charities, because not only was there an increased need for food, the way we had to deliver it was completely different because of the physical distancing. So we're all shifting. But but like Mike said, we've been partners with uh, MLSE and we love Chris, uh, Chef Zed, <laughs> so much because really, I, they're the brains behind this operation and we just got to benefit and the people we support got to benefit. So what happened at Second Harvest though is we actually run five training kitchens in the city where we provide them the uh, ingredients and they make meals and then we deliver them to organizations that don't have kitchen facilities. And as soon as COVID hit, they shut down. So we had no meals that uh, we were providing. So this really filled that need because we had, you know, we, we work with, the thing about Second Harvest is we're like perishable healthy food, but we're also barrier free. So if you're a senior center that needs food, you get food. If you're a domestic violence center that needs food, you get food. If you're a food bank that needs food, you get food. And all of those places are, are existing still need that food. And the way MLSE has managed this, 
like a just the beauty of seeing it inside the Raptors court was just phenomenal. Uh, but also the quality of these meals, like this isn't just food. The quality is like the best food you're ever going to see. And they're individually packed. So when you're working with a homeless shelter, you know, you can't congregate people, especially in organizations where, where there's a lot of uh, immune deficiencies and compromised systems. So this kind of grab and go, is ideal. So now I, you know, the stress level is less. I keep saying that because, you know, everybody's got this anxiety and this fear about food. If, if and if you're not food insecure, which we saw like rampant grabbing food at the grocery store. So just knowing it's there creates a sense of peace. So MLSE and the collaboration with all of these other partners has been amazing because even our fleet, we have a fleet, couldn't manage it right at the beginning. So FedEx came in and said, okay, we'll deliver over here. Like there, everybody's jumping in to help. Like we're all in this together. And I think as Canadians, we're just solid that way. Like we know the end goal is to make the world a better place. And MLSE has always shown incredible leadership. So I'm in no way surprised that this is happening because that's kind of who they are. That's in their DNA. Excellent. Um, as we've talked about, the partnership with MLSE goes beyond this initiative. I think it was, uh, Mike, to your earlier point, I think it was 27,000 pounds where food was dropped off before all this. And um, are there, you know, my mind shifts to hopefully <laughs> we'll, we'll have the players in the, the back on the court and the ice, the field uh, at some point um, this year. You know, uh, so the 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 kitchen, the 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 floor, the arena isn't going to be available, but you've got amazing kitchens. But Lori, just other um, forward-looking initiatives with MLSC. You know, one of them that comes to mind and uh, is you know, listen once or twice. Been fortunate uh, fortunate enough to be in a suite at a game, and you see the amazing food, and it gets wasted. How many people, you know, leave and and it's full. Does so by them, by them, right? So, so you, so you do, you step in, right? You step in, right? Exactly. Maybe, maybe about that because Sorry, some of the yeah. listeners are in the corporate community, right? So, so shine for a light sure. on that. So we've been <laughs> with MLEs for so many years; they could almost be a founder, uh, yeah. picking up their surplus product. And uh, several years ago, we transitioned to an even greater product by working with the suites and ensuring that food got to uh, people in need. But not only are they like like supporting with food, they also support with um, knowledge. So when we need to build a kitchen, we go and ask them, how do you build a kitchen? <laughs> and they always, you know, they're that level of intelligence and they have that um, experience that we don't necessarily have. And so they're the role model for lots and lots of things. So apologies, because they have been providing food to us and to our communities forever. And the food again, the quality, like people are opening their meals and going, wow, this is not food that they're they're used to getting. So it really elevates your self-esteem, just saying, I'm worth it. I deserve this. So uh, again, leaders. Best. <laughs> I love that point about you get a, a good meal. I was looking actually, uh, shame on me, I should have uh, kept that post from my daughter, but I remember seeing the quality of that meal was like unbelievable. It was in a beautiful packaging and it was a high end meal. And I love your point about, you know, somebody feels better about themselves if they've got uh, something other than, you know, a, a burger and fries, right? Uh, or, or, you know, half a sandwich. So uh, that was, that's cool. Um, Let's shift to the third and final part of the conversation, which is purpose-driven partnerships. And Mike asks, um, you know, brands are increasingly, I've noticed it, I've been fortunate enough to be uh, a judge for the Sponsorship Marketing Awards for a few years. And I've seen this, say, how brands are increasingly utilizing sponsorship programs to amplify a corporate social responsibility initiative. Are there Maybe you can expand, you're in a great position to expand on that point. Are there any examples that you can share. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've been talking about Sobe, so I thought I'd, I'd stay yeah. on that brand as, as it's sort of very relevant for today. But, you know, when I was looking at their CSR initiatives and their efforts, you know, it, it is very much focused on the importance of food nutrition, um, responding to local community needs, which is obviously more important now than ever. You know, they celebrate uh, Canadian young artists and athletes. And over the last, few years, we've really brought this to life through a partnership with the Special Olympics. And we've created 
you know, on ground uh, areas of not only food sampling, but food education. You know, we've um, created opportunities for volunteer support to get involved with Sobeys in the community. You know, there are areas for family viewing environments for the Special Olympic athletes and their community that is there to support them. There is opportunity for so Sobeys employee engagements. Um, and again, it all sort of takes this, this CSR effort that, that Sobeys is doing sort of sometimes even behind the scenes and really brings it to life through their partnership with Special Olympics. So if you're looking at, um, you know, something that, that we and we at XMC and Sobeys is very proud of, again, it's our efforts towards Special O and, and that example of, um, you know, a brand bringing CSR initiatives to life through sponsorship. You know, and, and uh, listen, as I said off the top, it's it, we're in the midst of, of such a crisis. It's hard to really put a, you know, uh, the, the magnitude of it is quite overwhelming. We, I think we are seeing in some respects a light uh, that I look for, it's my DNA to look for the silver linings. And, and one of them is, is the amount, and Laura, you touched on it, where, where Canadians, so many are stepping up and doing good, um, you know, and, and so, I hope and I expect post COVID brands will continue to embrace this purpose driven partnership mentality uh, in their engagements. Uh, you know, anything to any thoughts on that as you, you represent some clients and I'm sure you're advising them. How do you do it? But I imagine authenticity is, is going to be a very important term. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, you know, when we were looking at purpose driven engagements, we actually wanted to assess the sponsorship community as a whole. And if you're looking at what our recent sponsorship reports are publishing in terms of sponsorship investments, 70% right now is put into sport partnerships, which is great for our friends at MLC and we'd love to see it. The next category down, we're seeing 10% go into entertainment. So there's that gap between one and two and everything from cause and arts and other falls as a single digit investment. So. I think what that tells us is if you're looking at purpose driven sponsorships, I mean, it's an uncluttered space with opportunity. I predict, and I think, you know, you're just sort of saying it now that we're seeing what brands are able to produce during COVID. Again, this is an authentic approach to giving back to the communities, but consumers and just the communities are very perceptive to what is going on and how people are giving back and how brands are not only representing their communities, but just doing well. I think there's going to be a momentum shift. And, you know, again, my prediction is consumer insight reports are going to come back and they're going to tell a story that you can achieve brand love or brand affinity. And this momentum is going to continue to go in this direction coming out of, you know, this COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And, you know, we've known for a long time doing good is good for business, but the view I've taken is uh, looking at a little bit critically, um, I think the way a brand uh, behaved before the crisis uh, will play a big role on how well they get their 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 cause and their initiative gets accepted during. Because if you just step in for the first time and it's not in character with your brand, I think uh, some people could view it as a little bit inauthentic, opportunistic. So I think it's important for brands like like Sobeys has demonstrated to to you know, have behaved a certain way uh, throughout. And then, then it feels very genuine and authentic. Yeah, so that's, that's great. Lori, um, you know, we've talked about not-for-profits. Geez, they have to rely on, it's all about partnership to fulfill a mission. We know Sobeys is a partner of yours. Maybe just touch on a little bit from your perspective and if there are any other, you know, partnerships that just resonate with you that you want to talk about, but Sobeys is fine. Sobeys has been a partner and we love them. We go to their distribution centers and pick up quality food that uh, then goes into some of these kitchens to make meals like MLS emails. Um, we also, we're a national organization with our online platform, foodrescue.ca. And one of the first things that we did at Second Harvest was create a national task force to ensure we had supply chain understanding like right across the country. And we went to the Grocery Foundation, who Sobeys is a member of, and Sobeys put their hand up right away and said, I'm on that task force. And they are, and they've been real leaders there of making sure that we're connecting. So there's a private uh, industry group trying to figure out, okay, where are the spikes in food? Because we know with food service changing, uh, it couldn't pivot right away to grocery, but we're working those things out. 
But Sobeys, again, showed real leadership and, and we've been working with them for many, many years. But to be fair, like there's been an outpouring and there, there always has been, like we're a charity. So we, exactly, we rely on the generosity of businesses and individuals to ensure we can meet our mission. Um, but since COVID happened, you, you see that organizations that typically, you know, maybe don't work so well together, just letting it all go, just look like looking at the mission. This is the cause. This is what we have to get to. And all of that stuff just becomes noise. And you're looking back at it going, I can't believe that even happened. Like we are all in this together to make sure that people can have adequate food for their families. So Sobeys, MLSC, Loblaws has been great. Um, Honestly, there's a list of thousands. I'm so. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. No, it's like uh, uh, next. I was going to ask you which of your three sons is your favorite, but we'll we'll do that another time. Clearly, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Nancy. <laughs> we tell our girls that all the time. Listen, we do love one of you more than the other one, but let's. Uh, we won't tell you which one, right? Depends on the day, too. <laughs> Come on, exactly. Uh, uh, Mike B. Um, you know. We, we touched on this um, offline, but how community relations, the community relations team works very closely with uh, corporate partnership groups to amplify partnerships, maybe, uh, and sponsorship activations, maybe expand on that for, for the listeners. Yeah, you bet. And I think just even to build off something Mike uh, S said, you know, I think what we're going to find post COVID, um, post pandemic, but you were, you were starting to see it already is the public sector can only do so much sometimes and can only move so quickly and what we're seeing you know you look at the way that bell attack mental wellness with bell let's talk and some of the great initiatives that that are coming out of uh, corporate partners or corporations saying that's a social issue that we're going to attack we're going to be laser focused on it we're going to move quickly and swiftly and invest heavily in our resources like that um, that complement uh, from the corporate response is going to make addressing these social issues over time a lot easier, um, a lot more impact. Government can only do so much. And I think post COVID, we're going to see that as well. The corporations partnering up with social issues to attack them and address them and, and throw their might and resources behind solving it, or at least uh, doing our best to solve it is going to become a, a growing trend. So it's interesting. Mike mentions the 70% of sponsorships and partnerships within the sports space. Um, Jordan Vader and his team have a, a, a goal uh, at MLSC that 100% of the partnership deals that they write, they want to have at least one element of community uh, collaboration built into them. So you look at whether it's the Scotiabank Arena deal, um, a landmark deal. It had a million dollar a year, 20 year commitment from Scotiabank to what MLSC Foundation is doing at MLSC Launchpad. And we didn't put a, a lot of terms and conditions to that. What we agreed to is let's co-author what that looks like over the course of the 20 years. It's not our decision. It's not Scotia's decision. Let's co-author something that addresses a social issue that Scotia can be proud of, that Scotia can engage in. Um, you look at some of the other deals that, that we do with, with community affairs, We've got Launchpad. We've also got sport development. We've got camps and clinics and school programs that, you know, a company like Sun Life might not have the bandwidth to be on the ground delivering diabetes programming in schools with kids around a basketball class, but we do. So what we end up being to address social issues is a conduit for some of these well thought, you know, thought leadership organizations with passions and commitments and priorities to bring those to life much like mike and his business are activators for uh, their clients in the community or you know for their brands in the public we become activators for csr solutions because a lot of these companies that we work with don't have the workforce that actually naturally fits into that social investment day-to-day uh, -day activity but we can mobilize our people to do that and therefore create far far deeper partnerships with these organizations as a result. And then our CSR story becomes a shared CSR story with them. Perfect. That's great. I don't think people realize the depth of what goes into, as I say, an organization like yours and planning partnerships. And uh, you mentioned Vader and uh, I feel obligated anytime his name comes up to tell this silly story that uh, I'm responsible for everything he is. Uh, just, um, no, it, it goes back to um, 
I, I had the pleasure and fun of working in the crazy world at WWE early in my career, heading up sales and marketing. I hired this young, ambitious, smart uh, intern, and uh, Jordan uh, was that. And and uh, we just formed a bond, and, and it's amazing relationships endure. And I've been proud to, as a friend of his and a colleague, to watch his career take off at MLSE. is a smart guy, and I'm not surprised that that would be part of his DNA to, uh, and that part I take zero credit for. Um, so um, uh, good stuff. Let's wrap, you know, uh, I, it's the, 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 the only thing to do is give Lori the last word. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've hopefully put a spotlight on, on this amazing organization of yours and, and the, the need, the cause. Uh, maybe just tell the audience how they could get involved and support Second Harvest uh, going forward. Well, how you can support Second Harvest, but also support your local community is to go to the website foodrescue.ca. So if you're a food business and you have food, there's places that want to take it in your community. So if you go to foodrescue.ca, that is the place. And tell everybody, like awareness is what we need. We need to drive it everywhere because the food is there. And we're working with uh, commodities everywhere right now. And there's more coming to make sure it stays out of landfill. So please go to foodrescue.ca, help your community. Terrific. Well, listen, we could go on. Uh, I promise I keep it tight. Uh, I think we've done that. Thanks again to all of you for the time, for the insights. Um, best news of all for me, uh, uh, notifications scrolled across the top that uh, one of my golf courses is opening up. So this weekend's looking up. Um, but no, listen, wishing you continued success and, and health. And thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you.